In this uh, class, we have a short video of the dynamic compaction process and how it is done in the field. You can see that it is uh, being done next to a shopping complex. So, what you have seen is that it is a compaction using uh, dynamic uh, methods where you try to compact uh, as much as 10 meters of uh, the in situ soil uh, and improve its performance. As I just mentioned in my previous class, the way that we do is that we just have a tamper which will induce energy into the in situ soil and uh, this in situ soil becomes strengthened because of the energy impact that the material had. The energy whatever we have from the weight, weight into the height that is the potential energy that gets transferred to the soil in the form of uh, kinetic uh, in, the, in the movement, you know, it gets transferred to this uh, soil system. Uh, the the from that potential energy it gets uh, that whatever is the energy that gets transferred to the soil and then there could be some energy losses here because the soil itself is uh, a damping material. So, with the result that the soil is uh, quite strong, but at the same time it may not have the full energy uh, whatever is transferred, but the energy that is uh, transmitted to the system is good enough to see that it performs as a very good uh, uh, material wherein the settlements could be minimum and the bearing capacity is very good. So, as I said this dynamic compaction is a ground improvement technique which can be very useful uh, which densifies the fills by using a drop weight and uh, as you saw just now the drop weight is uh, uh, it can be a hardened steel plate or even it can be a weight whatever circular or whatever it is lifted by a crane and repeatedly dropped on the ground surface. The drop locations are typically located on a grid pattern like we see that uh, in a design now uh, in a few minutes. The spacing of which is determined by the subsurface conditions and foundation loading and geometry. Essentially we can have the uh, mo most of the times a grid pattern and the main thing is that the subsoil conditions like uh, the thing is that uh, to what extent is that soil uh, needs to be improved and then the what is the foundation loading that is coming and the geometry all that is very important 
and um, normally as a treating granular soils and fields uh, have always resulted in increased density, friction angles and stiffness. We will see this how it, it can happen and as I just mentioned this technique has been used to increase bearing capacity and decrease settlements and liquefaction potential for plant structures. In fact, uh, this is one of the very important applications. And in shallow cast geologies where the soil has a tendency to collapse, um, it actually reduces the voids prior to construction so that the uh, sinkhole formation or potential is reduced. Then uh, we also have been using this uh, dynamic compaction for many of the landfill projects because the landfills uh, in the, the problem with landfills is that uh, they have heterogeneous mixture of waste like uh, papers, uh, food and debris, construction debris and what, whatever you have waste materials, it is very difficult to compact, or compact uh, uh, waste materials in a systematic way. But then the dynamic compaction has been quite useful, why because it just directly uh, gives lot of internal energy to the soil uh, by means of this uh, process of dynamic compaction and uh, the behavior or the properties of the municipal waste so, municipal solid waste are not directly related to uh, uh, the anyway in the design it just that it put inputs lot of energy into the, uh, the soil system and uh, directly it results in better performance of the structure so it has been used in uh, parking lots it has been used in uh, highways actually uh, many places in years particularly even in india it has been done and to stabilize the large area of the embankment works then one of the most important considerations uh, regarding the applicability of the dynamic compaction the type of soil being densified. As I just mentioned um, it is very good for granular materials and the granular mat materials they enable excess pore pressures that develop during densification they dissipate rapidly. Uh, in the sense that the dynamic compaction has been very, uh, very, mal, very much used with uh, considerable effect in uh, coarse grain soils, um, but then it has been quite effective as well in sills, clay sills and sandy sills as well as in municipal solid waste and uh, so much so that it is one of the preferred options. Particularly when uh, the uh, uh, little like you know faster it should be uh, you know the rate of uh, uh, the rate of or the uh, you would like to need that uh, area at a uh, fast manner you know say for example if you are drawing for sand drains it could take long time but then in the case of dynamic compaction it can be required the area can be required quite quite, quite fast like uh, you must be able to design it properly that is one thing and then get the weights get the tamping get the proper contractor then once you have actually the thing is the in this process what you should do is that uh, you will be compacting up to not less than 10 to 10 to 15 meters you must be able to have the initial uh, soil profile uh, say either using uh, initial profile, soil profile as well as a CPT profile or an SPT profile and also after compaction you must be able to get the uh, SPT profile or a CPT profile. We will see how they are useful to us in a minute, but the first thing impo important thing is that how do you go about design? The design is something that is very, uh, 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 very important in this process, but it is a very simple principle that like you know you just compact a soil then it, it has a shape you know it has a one the weight uh, densifies a system like this a shape which can be a shape the approximate uh, shape of the uh, area that is going to be densified could be in this uh, form and this is a sectional view this is a top view of that and uh, this thing gives the like you have a, a compaction here you have a compaction here the, the spacing the SG is a spacing and uh, A and B are the parameters say for example, B is the depth of uh, area that you would like to uh, depth, depth of the soil that you would like to densify and A is the diameter just we will see some of these parameters. Actually but the, there is an approach available in literature uh, which can be useful to find out actually in a design we know what is the depth to be improved. So, we should be able to know what is the number of blows required what is the weight of the hammer required, what is the height of drop, what is the area of the uh, area of the you know cross section in the sense that if you have a, 
5 by 5 meter you know 5 meter you know diameter so pi by 4 into d square will give you the area of impact then b is the depth so uh, there is some relationship available in literature which has been quite useful to come out with once you know this uh, you will be able to know the dimensions a and b uh, so that either with this knowledge you will be able to properly get the idea of what should be the uh, in given that you have this weight say for example 10 ton or 15 ton weight and you know this is the height of drop and uh, its area of cross section is known you must be able to design what should be the uh, the spacing what should be the spacing and of course we should also cater to the depth of improvement also so we'll see that in an example for example the uh, the required significant depth of densification is given by di is half into square root of w h into h this is that uh, as a simple formula in which uh, earlier also i showed in the previous class about on the dynamic uh, compaction methods the di is a significant depth of densification wh is the weight of hammer h is the height of drop actually in that uh, previous uh, design diagram that i gave the depth of uh, in, uh, densification is nothing but the b if you see the figures they both are same and if you know the hammer weight the height of drop the dimensions of the cross section and thus the area and the depth can be obtained uh, so for example this is what we see and uh, this using this plot which is given in a canadian geotechnical journal paper you need to estimate the magnitude of this particular factor actually and uh, since these are all you have some numbers here say for example weight and height and all that you have to uh, you can determine the number of drops in a quite comfortable way and you will also cross check what will be the a and d values uh, like what is a so a is actually a tells you the spacing and b tells you the sp the uh, depth so for example in a typical example weight of the hammer is about 18.5 tons or 185 kilonewtons then the height of drop is about 26 meters and the weight the weight of the ha the the width of the hammer say for example it's 5 meters so first step is you calculate this uh, dip, depth of uh, significant uh, influence this is given by this expression about 10 meters is what is required about 11 meters now using these values and uh, now we assume d i have taken it as 5 meters and area of cross section is of 25 i am just assuming it as square for a simplicity and uh, if you just get this b by d you know actually when you i have to refer to the graph where i should go by these numbers it's i get a term called uh, to uh, this b by d is like uh, 10.96 divided by the diameter so 2.2 i'll get from the for this particular number i get a number nh is equal to 220 kilonewton per meter square now i know these weights already say for example i have given as wh as 18.5 height of drop and area of cross section everything is known so what for corresponding to 220 i should just uh, get back in this uh, particular term uh, the number of uh, drops so for example in this uh, term i know what is 220 so i am just getting back working back what is the number of drops so you will get a number 14 and once you know this from the same figure you can also get a by d so a by d in the same figure gives you 16 meters as a spacing so what it means is that thus using a square uh, plate of about 5 meters for a height of drop of 26 meters with 40 number of blows at a grid spacing of 16 meters using a weight of 18.5 and uh, tamping enables a 10.96 meters depth of improvement this is what the statement is like you are able to now design some in a, some sense uh, using these two figures uh, the uh, the depth of uh, the you, you are able to understand with a known weight and the height of drop you will know what exactly are the um, uh, variables involved in fact if you want to go for higher depth you can increase the depth of uh, height of fall or if you want any other you can always play with uh, some of the variables and come out with uh, whatever is required say for example if you need only 6 meters you can alter the whole design by using appropriately all the numbers essentially like you know the variables are that you will have you know height of drop is one variable and uh, the spacing is another variable so one can check and then uh, come out with a simple design 
and then once you have to because as I just mentioned here the design is a very uh, like you know, it is a very simplistic design and the best thing is that you have to verify how it is correct to what extent this uh, uh, deep compaction is effective. So, what you do is that we go for in situ evaluation of uh, uh, the deep compaction methods and uh, the way that we do is that you try to analyze the construction process itself like to what how is the process designed like as I just mentioned like uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, calculations procedures we have seen we can do a parametric study on that and do a proper uh, construction uh, sequence. Uh, and then also like say for example, uh, if there is a problem of noise also with the because of the deep compaction, you can even uh, go for uh, smaller heights and uh, closer spacing something like that you know one can always work out some, some sort of uh, processes uh, wherein um, you can still get the effective uh, improvement. And uh, the other important thing is pore pressure and settlement records because the pore pressures and settlements are very important. And uh, say for example, finally, you, you may have initial settlements very high, but the final settlements need to be very, very low that is subjective. So, you can only get that from settlement records and pore pressure uh, records. As I just mentioned, the many of these materials uh, like part particularly in the process of dynamic compaction, um, the pore pressure is mobilized because the rate of loading is so much that uh, there is lot of pore pressure generated and the rate of dissipation of pore pressure gives you what type of soil it is like say for example, in clays you can only say that pore pressure uh, mobilization is very important. So, you have to do the next time lag you know you need to really uh, uh, next type of next tamping when can you do like you know you have done uh, a few tampings now uh, how do you really release the next time the weight you know some of these things you can get an idea from uh, the pore pressures and settlements observations and uh, so that the things are effective like you know say for example, if you keep on tamping it without understanding its uh, pore pressure response uh, it may not be very effective, but if you really understand all the pore pressures to be dissipated to some extent and then again tamp it like you know your uh, uh, the sequence of tamping is something that can be properly optimized. Then uh, what we do is that requirement of the imported fill to achieve a certain grade. Sometimes uh, see what happens in a particular place like uh, the whole area is very soft and uh, or some so you are bringing some other uh, soil from nearby island and then you are trying to um, require see that it is uh, densified you know because in some places say for example, I just mentioned in uh, Singapore and other places you will see some more examples here you have to get soil from somewhere and start compacting. So, in this process what happens you have to really check if the imported soil has that uh, properties like if it, if it has achieved that uh, density or uh, uh, water content and all that. Then the another variable, another variable is that energy consumed by the equipment itself say for example, the uh, energy that you have put into the soil system is something that has a very good influence. If higher is the energy that is transferred to the uh, in situ system then more efficient is the process of compaction. So, you must be able to analyze uh, every bit of this information here and uh, come out with proper uh, understanding and uh, essentially when if you want to really qualitative quantitatively and uh, estimate the evaluation uh, the uh, the uh, the state of the soil because of the deep, com deep compaction you must uh, go ahead with some tests say for example uh, you are familiar with spt test deep penetration methods standard penetration resistance we should get and the advantage is that you have correlations with the SPT and uh, friction angle and relative density. Say for example, uh, if the SPT value is 10 or 15 you can say what is its friction angle and then what is its relative density. Say for example, an SPT of 30 indicates a good relative density. So, like this like if you have a C SPT profile much before the compaction process is done uh, you will understand how much is uh, the improved state of the soil. So, instead of the friction angle say for example, in situ soil SPT could be 10 now if it is improved to 30 it is an excellent uh, thing. Now, you also have cone penetration resistance which is we call it CPT test and here again we have correlations with uh, cone resistance like here the cone uh, continuously drives into the soil and the advantage with the cone penetration is that it is a continuous record of the skin friction, shaft friction, 
pore pressure ratio and many other things. The advantage of the CPT is that it is a continuous and it, it can uh, record many measurements. In fact, it can uh, uh, even measure uh, seismic wave velocity if you uh, have a proper tip to the uh, attachment to the cone. So, it is so much uh, useful nowadays. So, here again you have correlations with cone resistance and overburden pressure. So, in fact, as higher is the overburden, higher is its resistance and higher is the relative density. So, you have some uh, uh, the literature available which will clearly tell you if the density is very good. Then uh, the as I just mentioned compressibility estimates from penetration tests. Say for example, if you as I just mentioned settlements are very important. So, if you want to measure settlements uh, you need to have proper instrumentation and also you need to estimate settlements also. Say for example, you, ha you have an SPT value n say 10, it, 10. So, if you have uh, if you want to use a modulus in uh, any of the finite element calculations, so what, what happens is that you need to have these parameters in uh, one, once for analysis. Once you do an SPT test or a CPT, CPT test, how do you use that in the, uh, the analysis in design is very important. And uh, suppose you have an SPT, uh, SPT test, you can say that the Young's modulus is related to uh, SPT value in this form like E equal to 2.8 N MPA. It is a simple expression and um, say SPT 10 will give you about 28 MPA you know so which is somewhat uh, uh, poor, but then if you have a 30 number it is quite good. So, again stress and parameters from cone penetration test is another example, constraint mod modulus is another value that one can get. You have different types of moduli in soils like uh, uh, Young's modulus, uh, secant modulus and many other uh, parameters like you know uh, one dimensional modulus from constraint the one dimensional consolidation test, modulus from triaxial test. So, one should understand them properly and uh, so you can have even as a simple relationship if you know the cone penetration resistance QC value it is a 2.5 times a QC is another expression. There is another equipment that we use in a very nice manner which is called uh, pressure meter test in which uh, you have a, a small uh, tube which is a dia which has a diaphragm and once you insert it it expands and then you try to uh, find out the both the deformation and the pressure exerted to uh, create that uh, deformation. So, there are two types of equipment here one is called uh, uh, pre Menard's pressure meter and the other one is a self boring pressure meter actually the Menard's pressure meter is a very standard one which was uh, developed in uh, France uh, which people have used extensively and um, uh, it has some parameters you get Young's modulus you get limit pressure limit pressure is related to bearing capacity of soils. Then we have called is actually we have to create a boring when you try to make a uh, uh, when you do a test using Menard pressure meter, but later people have done a, a advancement that the pressure meter itself makes a self bore you know it is like you know you make a bore and then uh, put the instrument back the problem is that there could be a sampling disturbance and other things. So, they have overcome some of these problems by using what is called self boring pressure meter which is a very versatile equipment and people have used it. There is a here another equipment called dilatometer test see the pressure meter test and uh, uh, dilatometer test are very well practiced in uh, like in uh, Europe. For example, the pressure meter test is widely used in uh, 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 France and then dilatometer test is widely used in uh, Italy. Uh, because uh, they are the uh, countries of origin, but then they have found their places even in uh, uh, many other countries like US or even India for example, uh, pressure meter tests are done in NTPC projects and many important projects people have been doing. Even say for example, the dilatometer test is uh, it is a simple kit they have a simple kit and one can use that like you know you here again the principle is that you just uh, put that uh, instrument in a particular uh, bore hole and then you allow the diaphragm to expand and the, it, uh, the resistance to deformation is measured the diaphragm starts expanding because you will up, be applying some sort of pressure the pressure versus the deformation is recorded and um, so you will get lot of information uh, from both the tests because the thing is that the advantage is that you do not need to take undisturbed samples you are getting the response of the soil from uh, undisturbed state itself. So, there is some more uh, measurements on uh, shear wave velocities. Uh, which is very popular we will see some of them now. 
like say for example, this is a typ typical example. You can see that uh, you have a ground surface here and then the water table is here and uh, you have a silty fine medium sand here and it is about um, um, minus uh, like you know it is uh, there is a total depth of about um, uh, 11 to 12 meters. So, the thing is that so you need to really you know improve this and then the problem is you know you have a ground water table that is very tricky. So, under these conditions it is not uh, it is uh, dynamic compaction is quite effective. You can see here that before uh, the dynamic compaction the SPT values are like this like they are in the range of 10. Once it is uh, dynamic compaction is done you can see that they are in the range of 20. So, you can see that there is a good difference. And you, you see that in the case of a CPT quant penetration test results is the QC is a variable here. You can see that the QC is somewhat in the range of 5 kilo 5 MPa it just increases with depth. But then you have another you know um, QC gets improved with uh, uh, like this. Similarly, in the case of pressure meter test it is called limit pressure limit pressure is another important variable in uh, actually you will get a result from uh, uh, pressure meter uh, using an it in terms of the limit pressure. You can see that the limit pressure is low uh, when it is not uh, improved and uh, when it is improved it is there is a good uh, difference. So, uh, that is what I just mentioned the pressure meter this is a self boring pressure meter kit like this is that particular uh, material and then this is a gauge and uh, this is a, a system and then all of them you know this these are the extension wise you can go up to 10 to 20 30 meters quite comfortably and you will get a nice profile of its properties and a typical expansion here you can just see that we call it cavity strain say for example these things are all based on cavity expansion like you know you add uh, you it's a uh, there will be uh, oil and then you apply some pressure it cavity expands and then there is a strain here cavity expansion strain you are trying to measure and uh, so this is how loading portion is there and uh, loading and then this is unloading it comes back. So, this will be the in a particular borehole say for example, this is a old record uh, somewhere which I took from this some source you can see that total pressure versus the cavity strain is given uh, this can be used to obtain various properties such as Young's modulus, bearing capacity, settlements, Poisson's ratio many things there are lot of uh, information on this. So, this is a dilatometer I just mentioned a similar one which in where you have a diaphragm here and then it is a simple kit actually it is a very simple equipment this also has a very versatile applications and shear wave velocity measurements here again like I just mentioned whether the dilatometer is also very useful pressure meter is also very useful and shear wave velocity measurements. So, for example, in shear wave velocity what do you measure we measure the shear wave velocity and um, actually since the shear wave velocities are measured from uh, in a very using uh, you know uh, you know you just have a an impulse created and you also have a pickup say for example, here in this case like you have an impulse here then you have a rod here you have a wedge then it is picked up uh, by a geophone and then based on this you have uh, shear shear modulus measurements Young's modulus measurements and all that. So, you can see the difference here like before uh, dynamic compaction the E values uh, the shear wave velocity values are uh, like this whereas, after deep compaction it can be like this. So, what I mean is that some of these in situ techniques are very very essential uh, particularly right from uh, SPT value cone penetration pressure meter then uh, flat dilatometer and shear wave velocity measurements have been very effective in uh, improving the in, uh, in assessing the improved state of the ground. So, what I will do is that I will just take you to a few case studies. Uh, because uh, the this is say we have some case studies which are well documented. Um, you can see that this is a nice airport runway new runway. In this case an extension was made for the existing nice airport by constructing two new runways. The runway length is about 3.2 kilometers long parallel to the shoreline on a reclaimed land 
actually the reclaimed land is something that has a very low properties uh, low like you know the soil conditions were loose fill some stiff malls and deposits of soft sandy soils and um, hence there was a need for heavy dynamic compaction in or and around the I mean close to the runway this is the problem and uh, so what they did was that uh, they they had to place about 20 million meter cube quantity is so high 20 million meter cube of fill to build a reclaimed platform of 200 hectares area you can see imagine that that area 200 hectares is quite high uh, the borrow pit was situated at a distance of 13 kilometers from the main site the transport was made by means of a fleet of about 38 dumper trucks you know the number of trucks that are going from uh, the uh, over the distance of 4, 13 kilometers or about 38 and they have a trailer weight of 145 tons you know with the weight that they can carry you know you must be able to design your uh, even your uh, uh, the transportation system also very well in a ground improvement pro uh, project because you cannot uh, you there is no you cannot you have to get as much as uh, material uh, as possible so that uh, you can start reclaiming and then uh, doing a compaction and then recover the soil faster. So, you this is a big uh, process involved in this uh, uh, process in this uh, planning of operations for dynamic compaction. So, in this case the evaluation the evaluation of pore pressure was continuously monitored at various depths is during the dynamic compaction. As I just mentioned the pore pressure uh, variations during dynamic compaction have a very significant role on trying to uh, decide about the uh, construction you know the uh, tamping operations the release of load and all that. So, the work in this case have, have, have was done in uh, phases with sufficient resting periods to avoid building up of excess pore pressure. The volume versus DC or the dynamic compaction energy governed the intensity of the treatment. So, for example, how much is the volume uh, that has uh, been uh, uh, compacted and the energy input into the system is something that is very important and uh, they were able to understand this process and uh, during the dynamic compaction after the treatment they have done number of CPT tests, pressure meter tests to control the fill characteristics. You can see that this is the process of uh, compacting like you can just see that they have a uh, spe specific sequence here. So, uh, there is another example here where uh, for a desalination plant in Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, it, this is one of the plants which required uh, uh, which was required to be constructed to meet the growing demands of the water and electricity in Saudi Arabia in uh, some close to about 1 10 kilometers from Jeddah. And the soil has two types of profiles and this first one was a, a the loose material loose to dense sand and the second profile was a composed of soft or a very loose silty sand. This was followed by bedrock. So, you can see that it is quite uh, complex and uh, so what they did like it has uh, the projects also had it is quite uh, uh, huge like since it is a more of a water supply project it had uh, 12 operators, 3 tanks and number of related buildings. The tankers diameter and height were about uh, 106 meters and 20 meters height. The design criteria stipulated a bearing capacity and uh, maximum settlement of about 200 uh, kp and settlement uh, of 75 mm for the tanks. See this is even we have you know for example, in uh, very soft soils on soft soils you must be able to construct. Uh, uh, water tanks in villages. So, for example, in many of the coastal areas in India. So, the bearing capacity requirement could be like this and the settlements could be uh, even this 75 mm is uh, valid there also. So, you need to really improve the uh, particular thing using particular some sort of ground improvement technique. So, that way one can see that this is a very stringent requirement. You can see that for the water tanks they had a ton 200 kPa uh, as the bearing uh, capacity and 75 mm is the settlement. For other structures the same was required to be 150 kPa and 25 mm set respectively like you know 70 mm is uh, it all of structures 
say for example, the water tanks, it could be little higher in maybe a raft type of foundation that they had. But in this case of isolated footings, you should have a settlement of 125 mm or something. So, it is very important that the whole area needs to be stabilized. So, because there was a presence of loose sands and soft silts, it was decided to optimize the foundation solution by implementing dynamic compaction and dynamic replacement in the project. So, the choice of this technique was dependent on the uh, soil characteristics. You can see that uh, upon completion of the soil implement, uh, this is the type of uh, work that, uh, that they have undertaken this from uh, uh, the uh, particular company. Uh, they have done 75 pressure meter tests and uh, load tests to demonstrate that the acceptance criteria had been achieved. Say for example, the acceptance criteria is what? The bearing pressure and settlement. So, you can calculate the bearing pressure settlement using uh, uh, limit, you, have, you get a parameter called limit pressure. Limit pressure is related to bearing capacity uh, from pressure meter test and also settlements could also be calculated. So, the acceptance criteria of settlements and bearing capacity is met using this. So, the results clearly showed that the success of the ground project and the ability of the foundation to safely support the design loads. So, essentially you must be able to give guarantee for whatever you do. Uh, say for example, the soil is so soft, you must be able to improve to the required capacity, whatever the client asks. So, that is a very important uh, thing here and you can see that it is a, a square one, a square uh, uh, plate that what we use in our uh, uh, design, uh, roughly square. Okay. There is another one which is uh, an airport that uh, close to a road actually. Uh, it is widened up to 200 meters by reclamation of about, uh, it is about 0.9 million square meters actually. It is for using dredge sand for a depth varying from 4 to 12 meters like you know the road widening project you know. So, it has to, it is a lot of filling is involved. So, they removed, they got the sand from some places and then they filled up to 4 to uh, 12 meters and um, the length of the structure is about 4.75 kilometers and um, actually it, it was, it should have been anchored with sheet well walls, but it could not be embedded into hard rock and it was necessary to be equilibrated by well compacted submarine backfill to generate necessary horizontal reaction. Actually, you know in the sheet pile wall construction, the uh, thing is that you also need if you have a well compacted backfill as a uh, in the uh, behind the sheet piles, the air pressures uh, coming onto the retaining wall are much less. Like you know, the you can optimize the design in a proper way. So, for example, you have a sheet pile wall, you have a less good backfill that is uh, next to the sheet pile wall. Definitely, the load that uh, the uh, uh, that that comes on the sheet pile wall will will be much lesser compared to uh, what it can be in the case of a poor soil. So, what they did was that. Uh, they used a dynamic compaction with a 15 ton pounder and a high energy dynamic compaction you know you, you have two types was done for the main part of the fill with spe special a, uh, emphasis on areas with sockets. So, you can see that next to the sea beach uh, this is all done and uh, the uh, near the sea beach like with a denser grid on the initial en enlarged area and uh, a platform was constructed later excavated after soil improvement completion was done to achieve the final shape. So, measurements were done with uh, pressure meter test and finite, finite element calculations. In fact, uh, one should verify some of these calculations and prove that and uh, because you need uh, parameters like Seng's modulus and uh, other uh, 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 Poisson's ratio and other mod model parameters for finite elements, one should use sophisticated testing. That is the reason, in fact, um, a pressure meter test was used. So, the what I would like to say is that, um, um, of course, I must thank uh, some of the sources from which I got this uh, particular equipment, like particularly Howard Baker and Menard, uh, the, this thing, and Hausmann is a book I followed. What I want to say is that. Uh, we are able to uh, in this uh, particular section, we are able to understand what exactly are the uh, issues that are involved with uh, uh, dynamic uh, compaction and uh, 
uh, we have seen uh, how uh, what are the different types of uh, dynamic compaction involved say for example uh, dynamic consolidation is one variable uh, we have seen actually whole of the Changi airport was uh, constructed because of that and uh, there are some more case studies that we have seen and uh, so this technique we are able to see the design like you know we have used a simple method in which uh, you can design based on the weight of the uh, weight available you can uh, design the height of drop and the spacing and uh, for the required depth of improvement actually the depth of requirement uh, required depends on say for example you say that um, 2b is a significant zone say for example you have a footing b uh, 2b is a significant uh, the depth of pressure bulb so one must be able to calculate uh, the significant zone say for example using uh, even finite element calculations you can simulate the whole structure at the top of the uh, soil and then understand where the stresses are coming say for example if the stresses are going to reach to a very soft area then the problem is that it could lead to lot of settlements and uh, one should really optimize and then see that those uh, settlements are not there and then uh, so these are all some of the issues that uh, one needs to understand and see that dynamic compaction is done in a proper way and uh, there have been many case studies even in India also where uh, particularly in uh, many of the coastal areas the dynamic compaction was done in flash ponds it, it was done. So uh, it has been quite effective uh, because uh, the method itself is quite simple like uh, uh, it only involves the weight to be dropped for a, a pre it is uh, everything is uh, pre designed and uh, say for example the height and the spacing and all and the only problem is how, to what extent you are correct you know is the improved uh, ground ok. So that can be only ensured by uh, proper uh, you know uh, institute testing using uh, SPT or a cone penetration or pressure meter test. Once it is done it is ready for further construction. We will take up uh, one more case study uh, on uh, dynamic compaction this is a case study from India where it is for a fertilizer uh, plant at uh, Babrala UP. Uh, the ground improvement technique using uh, dynamic compaction was required. In this area the you have a surface layer of silty sandy clay of about 1 to 2 meters and uh, beneath that you have a s uh, loose fine sand of about 10 to 12 meters and again a silty clay. Uh, the parameters available at the site before treatment indicate that the allowable net bearing capacity was about 60 kPa whatever is the allowable uh, bearing pressure is about 60 kPa and the other design requirement was that for this fertilizer plant uh, people have done a seismic risk analysis and uh, they find that the risk the design earthquake coefficient uh, should be corresponding to an earthquake of magnitude of 6.4 which is uh, corresponding to peak acceleration of about 0.2 g. So what they observed was that if you have this sort of uh, acceleration that is coming in the site then since the material is of uh, loose sandy uh, type there is a possibility of significant liquefaction and they do not want that. So they wanted to essentially go for a ground improvement technique which has uh, been essentially using dynamic compaction. Um, these are all the areas that they have identified in the site. It has uh, a big area uh, which has been uh, marked here A, B, C, E, D all that and uh, first thing what they did was that uh, trial was done in uh, areas of 30 by 30 meters using dynamic compaction. because it is very important to just do a trial test in dynamic uh, I mean in a dynamic compaction or even for that matter in any ground improvement technique because you will exactly understand uh, how is it working in the uh, field and you, you can fine tune it also like if you are not really doing well or if uh, the assumptions whatever you made are not appropriate then you can really uh, leave, make some corrections in the design. Uh, you can see that this is the experiment that was done on the uh, field you know trial trial site where they did uh, uh, static cone penetration both uh, SPT as well as uh, standard penetration as well as static cone penetration test and this is the figure that shows the uh, profiles. 
you can see that the SPT profile is uh, very clear like you know the SPT value is very low like 5, five, kil, five uh, blows and then whereas it increases about 15 which is not really a good number. I mean so of course we know the trend that the strength increases with depth but even the value of 5 to 10 is quite low. Now after the uh, improvement they just see that they made it uh, they did a some sort of uh, testing in it in the it is a trial section you can see that the SPT improved to some extent and it was good everywhere the this point was away from uh, this point and there is a good difference and uh, one can also see that there is another line that if you take uh, SPT values after one month there is another increase some more increase what it means is that and normally you know like uh, in uh, the time dependent behavior is there if you allow things to happen like you know say for example con consolidation is a time dependent uh, phenomenon in clays even in uh, sands also like you know because of the pore pressure uh, dissipation in uh, about uh, 15 days to one month time uh, there was an increase in uh, strength which was observed which is good. So, based on the results from the trials modifications were introduced to obtain the allowable bearing pressure of 200 kPa at 2 meters depth this is what they wanted. So, for example, uh, this is the allowable bearing pressure 200 kPa 2 meters depth and the other thing was that no liquefaction should occur in the improved uh, ground during the earthquake. Actually the requirement is that in fact, uh, there is a standard rule like if the SPT value is about uh, 25 you know then the liquefaction will not occur which means that there is a very good density. So, there are some criteria one needs to fix up in the particular site and um, so that say for example, we know that uh, uh, we, we know how to conduct an SPT test, we know how to correct all the uh, they have so many corrections in the SPT test. So, one should get the correct uh, number like a design SPT value and then correct it uh, using the for the energy you know energy like 0.65 or the 65 percent efficiency and all that and there is a criteria that uh, whatever uh, like you know you should be able to get the number you know what should be the actual field number that should be there that you should achieve with your uh, equipment one should be able to get. So, for example, if it is 25 as a SPT value then everywhere all along the profile the SPT value should be more than 25 or 20 whatever. So, in this case once they really figured out that uh, these are the uh, requirements in the particular site. Uh, they went ahead with the treatment and it is uh, very interesting that they had 4 passes it is not uh, number of passes like 4 tampings. The first pass was with a 10 ton hammer falling 16 meters. The second pass was second pass was similar, but the locations were staggered like you know they just put a little bit of staggering there and then third pass is with a 15 ton hammer falling 16 meters. Now, the weight of the tons is uh, like you know it is a little higher like 15 tons in the previous case it was 10 tons and uh, finally, the in the last one they, the it was made with a 5 ton hammer falling on uh, si falling 16 meters on a grid of 2.5 into 2.5. Uh, actually in the beginning itself I just said you know if you just make it uh, uh, you know closer closer then uh, you know you have a shallow depths densified if you take little deeper the possibility is that the deeper materials get uh, strengthened. So, uh, these concepts one can use and then come out with some uh, a good improvement. You can see that the uh, treated soil was uh, you know uh, as assessed in terms of the SPT values because that is a assurance you know like if the contractor does that uh, work you have to see that he, you get this number. So, the quality assurance program consisted of having SPT values more than what is required. So, for example, you can see that uh, this is the before it was like this, but whereas it was consistently about 20 say for example, it is 20 which is reasonable. Um, so, this is in a particular location area A. Then in the other location area B you can see that it is all always more than 20 everywhere you can just say that uh, one point it is touching. Uh, here you can see that in the area C like there is some one point which is somewhat less than 20, but all other points are uh, ok. So, actually sometimes you know this also like you know 
the earlier the specification was that at, at the top uh, 2 meters there should be a good bearing capacity okay, this could be an aberration actually because uh, the possibility is that this uh, you know when there is a good value here there is a good value here possibly this number could be wrong. So, one should really take like that and then come out to say that yes this uh, uh, SPT value criteria is satisfactory. So, this was what uh, the people uh, normally say and um, in this case uh, definitely the dynamic compaction was very successful in significantly increasing the strength of the soil and uh, this translates to a more than three fold increase in bearing capacity like you know what we thought was 60 kPa now you got 200 kPa. So, that was quite good. Then the soils were treated to loose sands the uh, up to a depth of about 12.5 meters and bearing capacities increased to whatever we wanted and also the um, earthquake resistant design was a possible that was what I meant and uh, particularly this uh, people have explored lot of other options in the site like uh, any other uh, similar tr treatments like uh, removing the whole soil trying to backfill and some of them you know like trying to do the piling you know. So, for example, if you want to increase the bearing capacity of the foundation area like you know you why do not you go for piles why do you go for just simply compaction which we do not know much. So, some people you know like any depends on the consultant that uh, the project has if somebody is a geotechnical consultant he will be able to give geotechnical alternatives, but if there is a structural consultant maybe he may recommend uh, piles because he has lot of confidence. So, in this case the technique was very effective and uh, you know cost effective in fact, uh, the uh, it is very ch maybe 40 percent cheaper or even 50 60 percent because piles are expensive and uh, definitely when you do the compared to just a tamping that you are trying to use and do SPT test and all that definitely uh, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to improve the soil as it is try rather than trying to remove the soil and then put with uh, an RCC and you know put some piles and all that which is a not uh, which is uh, efficient in in terms of the efficiency definitely you should improve whatever is existing then that may be always cheaper than trying to replace the whole material or try to ignore that material like soil strength. You ignore the soil strength actually in many of these cases you do not uh, particularly when you design the uh, pile foundation you do not consider the soil between the two piles pile groups or you know what is the role maybe you can consider the skin friction and something like that in a uh, sandy material, but its contribution largely is ignored. But then here in the ground improvement techniques what we do is that we just compact the material to what we want like uh, then some performance you specify say for example, SPT 20 you will get it uh, you have to you have to do it till you get it. So, particularly this is very useful when you are trying to handle large foundation areas say for example, uh, you know uh, costly areas uh, they result in cost effective uh, solutions because depending on the size of the project the type of uh, soil conditions say for example, as I just mentioned the uh, um, the techniques of um, dynamic compaction it can the range is quite big like right from uh, municipal solid waste to sands it can take care and the cost of suitable fill material is also important like in some places you have to borrow some material like say for example, we just now you know in, uh, in the previous case studies we saw that in, in some places to construct the airport you should bring land soil from nearby islands. So, possible possibility is that they could be expensive. So, one should really weigh against many uh, uh, alternatives and decide about which is the best. So, in this lecture I would like to thank uh, many of these people uh, Shafra Jali, Professor Gandhi and then some material I have taken from this and Hasman book. So, I am sure that uh, with this uh, you have a good uh, understanding of the uh, ground improvement technique using dynamic compaction.